Hi, I'm Dr. Chuck from Your Filthy Mouth. Today we're going to be talking about sleep disordered breathing. Do you have it, don't you? How do you find out? Stay tuned. Your smile is beautiful and possibly deadly. Dr. Chuck is here to tell you how your mouth can hold the key to your overall health. Now, about that filthy mouth of yours. Hi, I'm Suzanne Lynn. I'm here with Dr. Chuck, and uh, we are here on Your Filthy Mouth to talk about specifically what's happening in your mouth and how it can be affecting your overall health. So today we're going to be talking about sleep, disordered breathing, the slow understanding people will call it sleep apnea or, you know. Well, we don't know if it's sleep apnea yet. That's a different thing? That's a different thing. All right, well, we're okay. going to get into that. Yeah. Hang on a second. We, we need to encourage our friends to subscribe because we don't want you to miss an episode. So just hit the subscribe. We really appreciate it. And that way you'll know when a new episode comes out. So, okay. So let's get into the sleep disordered breathing. Right. Okay. You can have sleep disordered breathing, which means that when you're sleeping at night, maybe you're not falling into all the different phases of sleep. Our body does the best healing when we're in the, the deepest sleep that we can get in. Well, sometimes the body never gets there because it's gasping for breath sometimes. Hmm. Many people, when they lay back, their tongue actually falls back against the back of the throat. That can cut off the air supply. Well, most people will roll on their side, they breathe okay, but for some people, the air is cut off and they, they measure something called AHI, was how many times an hour do you stop breathing for 10 seconds or more? Oh my gosh, that's, yeah. that's horrible. Yeah, and you wouldn't think, well, you shouldn't stop right. at all. Right. Well, believe it or not, five times or less is considered normal. You can stop breathing for 10 seconds or more, five times or less, and you're pretty normal. Wow. Okay. If you stop breathing for 10 seconds or more for five to 15 times an hour, you're considered to have stage one uh, sleep apnea, or they call it mild sleep apnea. Okay. If you're stopping breathing 15 times for 10 seconds or long, longer an hour, that to me is it's not just mild. I mean, so you got to be a little bit, right. you know, be aware of that yeah. because between 15 and 30, they call moderate. So that sounds you, extreme to me. That's not moderate. Yeah. So 30 <clears throat> times that means that means uh, uh, every two minutes you're stopping breathing for 10 seconds or more. Wow. Yeah. And there are people that do that, and they can't understand why they're so sleepy the next day, or why they never get all the way into the deep sleep. Well, if you're stopping breathing for 30 times or more um, uh, an hour for 10 seconds or more, that's considered severe sleep apnea. Well, a lot of times these people can have it but not know they have it. How do you know if you're sleeping? Well, a very good indicator is a sleep partner, a bed partner. So if you've got someone and you're snoring, that's a number one a, a giveaway. If you're snoring, I think they've shown about 80% of the people that snore do have some type of sleep disorder breathing. So that's number one right there. Okay. But if your bed partner is snoring, um, that's that can be irritating, but it's not life threatening. But many times it is irritating. <laughs> yeah, is, I mean, yeah. I hear. Well, one, one person <laughs> snores; it doesn't affect one person; it affects two. Right. So they got the person who's not getting a good night's sleep, and you got the other person who can't get to sleep. Right. So a lot of people are in separate rooms, mm -hmm. which would mm -hmm. it'd be nice not to, to sure. do that. So the whole idea is to how can you get the brain. Um, properly oxygenated throughout the night because the next day if you're a little bit sleepy um, maybe you didn't get a good night's sleep sure. you maybe to figure out what's going on but the question is how do you diagnose whether or not you have what you talked about, about before sleep apnea or not how do you know it's just sleep disordered breathing or is sleep apnea all right so let's let's jump ahead and let's assume that is uh, an issue and people need to address it somehow what are some options well one of the things you can do is go to a sleep physician because they will uh, do some questioning on you. Uh, they may want a sleep test in their, in their sleep laboratory uh, where you spend the night there. Okay. They'll hook you up to uh, wires and, and uh, different gadgets and, and they'll record what's happening to your body when you're sleeping overnight. Then they'll, they'll uh, uh, go through the data and they can better diagnose and say, gee, how many times an hour did you stop breathing? Okay. Were you really asleep? Let's look at your, your, your brain pattern. Were you sleeping or were you just had your eyes closed? I mean, there's a lot of things they look at to determine whether you not have have sleep apnea or not, and then what stage you're in. Okay, Are so you... I'll be honest with you. Okay. That sounds expensive, and it sounds like um, a real commitment to have to sleep and go somewhere for a study like that. Well, that used to be about the only way you could get a sleep study done. The last few years, they've really come up with something called home sleep studies. Okay. Okay, this is where the company will send the sleep study to you, 
to you at your home. Okay. They'll review the, the technique on how you have to hook yourself up. Usually you'll, you'll record yourself for one or two nights, preferably two nights, so you okay. can get a, a better average of what's really happening. Send that back to the company. They have specially trained sleep physicians review the data, and then they can tell you whether or not you've got any type of sleep disorder breathing. I had one patient in, she thought for sure th she had it because she snored so bad. Right. Her husband said there's, you know, and we looked at, and in a two night period, she snored over 2,500 times. Whoa. Yeah. yeah, so no wonder, but she didn't have sleep apnea. You know, when you look at her oxygen levels, what was happening? So she had a snoring issue, but she didn't have sleep apnea. Okay. Well, you need to find out whether you do or you don't. Right. And that's why it's important to have a sleep study. Whether you do it in one of the sleep labs with a polysomnogram, or you do it at your own home with a uh, home sleep study. What are some of the fixes either way? Well, if you've got <clears throat> severe sleep apnea, remember that's 30 times an hour you're stopping breathing for 10 seconds or more. The number one choice is a CPAP. Okay. Um, you, you, what they do is they actually blow air up into your mouth or into your nose so it can fill up. It's like blowing up a balloon. And so you're going to get air in there no matter what. Right. And that's the Cadillac. If you can tolerate it, that's wonderful. It seems like people are uncomfortable with that, though. That's the biggest challenge. Do they wear it? Well, they have different masks. They can try different things. For some people, they finally come up with a solution that seems to work for them, and that's wonderful. So if you can wear that CPAP and it's working for you, super. Sure. But if you're not wearing it, and that's mm -hmm. the, the big deal, or you're wearing it two hours out of the night, you know, if, a, if the CPAP is 100% effective, they've shown that some of the oral appliances, oral devices, are about 70% okay. as effective. The question is, when you're not wearing it, it's 0% effective. Right, right, so, right. Uh, sometimes you may need to, to compromise a little bit just so you can do a 70% chance is, is better than nothing. So that's like a device that you have specially made for your mouth and, and it keeps your airway open or something? It, it's <coughs> a, They're called mandibular advancement devices. you got to be careful how you make them. I mean, they've got some that you can uh, buy at the store, but they're, they're sure. not custom made. Okay. They can cause other issues. But you want to have one. You, first of all, you want to go to a dentist who knows how to make these. Okay. And because not all dentists are trained the same. Um, so you want to go to a dentist who does this and knows what they're doing. Uh, but then what they do is, is they make impressions. They um, fit this device in there. They adjust it. It's called titrating to where you want to. What it does is it moves the lower jaw forward just enough to open up the airway behind the tongue so that air can get behind the tongue. Because if the tongue is slapping against the back, air can't get through. Get if you, you bring that jaw forward, the tongue is going to follow and it opens up that airway and you're breathing. So if you're not wearing it, find out what is going to work for you, basically. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So, I mean, the CPAP is, if you're going to do it, great. Um, if you're not going to wear it, oral devices hmm. is uh, plan B. According to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, which is made up of physicians, they say that if you've got mild to moderate, which is, remember, stopping breathing from five all the way up to 30 times an hour, okay, um, you can begin treatment with one of the oral devices, oral appliances, and you don't have to strike the CPAP. Okay. One of the challenges, a lot of people are not aware of the options they have, and they think it's a CPAP or nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, the CPAP is the best, and there's no argument about that, but if you're not gonna wear the CPAP, you've got to be aware of some of the different options, and that's what we're trying to do, is make you aware that you've got more than one choice. So see your dentist, talk to him about it. Don't just take for granted that you're sleeping okay if you have questions. And if your dentist isn't familiar with these things, look for a dentist that is, get online, mm -hmm. look on, under, um, uh, it's called OAT, Oral Appliance Therapy, um, and do your research, see what's available out there. So sometimes you gotta, you gotta stand up for yourself. Yeah. yeah. All right, stay tuned. We're gonna take a question of the week from Michelle next. It's a very interesting question. Here's Dr. Chuck's question of the week. Okay, Dr. Chuck, today's question of the week comes from our viewer, Michelle, and um, she's asking about whitening your teeth. The difference between in-house dental whitening opposed to over-the-counter whitening strips, what you need to look for and how effective they are. Well, first of all, whatever works. I'm not hung up on any particular thing. It's like, what's the best way to brush your teeth? Whichever way is working the very best. Okay. That, that's it. Uh, are you going to hurt yourself using some of the different white strips that they have? Generally not. Okay. Um, you can try them. You can see how they do. For some people, it may whiten up enough to where you're happy. Okay. For other people, it's not going to whiten up enough. 
all teeth are not the same. All enamel is not the same. You mm -hmm. had different things to eat when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. They're not everything formed the same. So some pe teeth will lighten really nice. And some uh, coffee teeth won't, right? Well, you can get the coffee stains off. <laughs> okay, you, know, you can get good. that off. <laughs> but we're not all the same. Right. So on some people, you're going to get a really good job. On other people, not such a good job. So the people who not such a great job with over-the-counter, does that mean they're needing to do in-house and dental whitening? When you do the dental whitening in the office, the percentage of the, the uh, different whitening gels we're able to use is a little higher because we put a protective barrier on your gums so it doesn't touch your gums. So we can use a little little stronger gel on that. And uh, it takes takes a little while. You can't really do this at home. Right. Um, does it work better than, than the other? On most people, yes, and that's okay. why I can't give someone a guarantee, you know, your teeth can go from here to here. Well, it depends on the makeup of that tooth. I've had some people go from here to here. I've had other people go from here to here. Okay. And no matter what whitening system you use, you may go from here to here, but they're all going to rebound a little bit. They're going to back up just a little bit. Okay. And that's why many of them give touch-up pens or some other oh, things sure. where you can lighten them back up sure. again. All right. So, Michelle, good question. Um, yeah. If you go to yourfilthymouth.com and you ask a question, you can write it in. We prefer if you go ahead and uh, click the record button. And if we use your question, yep. we're going to order some cool coffee mugs, yeah. uh, your filthy mouth coffee mugs, and we'll send one to you. So, all right, Dr. Chuck, today we talked about sleep disordered breathing. Right. I just want to go right to sleep apnea, but that's you educated us. That's not the proper term because there's different stages. You don't know. What are the three takeaways from today? Well, number one, you want to get diagnosed. Okay. You want to find out if you do, if, if there's even a chance that you might have it, uh, you want to get diagnosed. Um, I had a buddy of mine, he's 37 years old, didn't wake up. Mm. And his wife sent the kids and go wake up daddy. He's sleeping too late. And daddy was gone. Sad. And this is, is horrible, but that's reality. So number one, get diagnosed. Number two, if they tell you to wear a device, wear that device. If it's a CPAP, whatever it is, wear it. And, but number three is if you're not gonna wear it, go for your options. Go get, get something in there, because um, not only does it affect, you know, death is the ultimate on there, sure. but the way you feel the next day, falling asleep at the wheel, getting drowsy, you just, I never can wake up during mm -hmm. the day. You your know? partner, yeah. <laughs> well thank you. Yeah, right? yeah, so uh, these, are, these are a lot of reasons. So one of the biggest things is high blood pressure. Mm. People are on a couple of medications, it's hard to get the blood pressure under control. A lot of times it's because they're not sleeping well. And that heart, when you're not getting the oxygen in there, their heart is going boom, 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 boom. It's really trying to keep you alive. So, wow. yeah, we're putting quite a stress on the cardiovascular system. All right. This is pretty serious stuff. We want you to share this yeah. information with your friends and family. Um, and also subscribe. Make sure you don't miss any yeah. of the episodes of Your Filthy Mouth. And uh, thanks for coming over. We're going to uh, have some cool episodes next week, so stick around. Yeah, looking forward to it. Have a great day. This has been Your Filthy Mouth a weekly podcast about how what happens in your mouth affects the rest of your body. This is important information, so please share it with your friends. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button on YouTube, iTunes, and all the other podcast sites. And drop by yourfilthymouth.com to ask Dr. Chuck a question or find dozens of links to information about oral systemic health. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>